Good day, beautiful people, and welcome to my podcast, Life Treasures and Golden Moments. This is Natalie Silva. This month, I'd like to share some stories by the author, Karen Kingsbury. I want to tell you a little bit about Karen and the beautiful stories that she's written. She used to work for the Los Angeles Times before becoming a novelist. Some of her stories were even picked up by the Hallmark Channel, and they made movies out of them. Karen came across an abundance of real-life miracle stories, encouraging her to uh, do her writing and put a book together so other people could find hope in their lives that um, even in the darkest times in our lives, sometimes we all have things hit us. And uh, to let you know that it doesn't last forever and the sunshine will come out again, God's sunshine And uh, it's just behind the clouds and all is well again. So I think you'll enjoy these stories today. And one is about uh, an adoption. One is about friendship. And one is about a very special miracle that happened to a family. Miracle of the Heart. Kate English lost her heart sometime after her junior year in college. Kurt, the young man she fell in love with, was perfect in every way. He was interested in criminal justice, same as her. He shared his faith and love of the outdoors, and especially because he loved children. We'll have a whole house full of kids, Kurt would tell her as they strolled the campus hand in hand. Kate felt that God had hand-delivered Kurt to her. They spent the fall of their senior year planning a summer wedding and looking forward to the future. But a few months later, Kate and Kurt were driving across Pennsylvania to see her parents when they were hit head-on by a drunk driver. Kurt broke his leg but survived the accident with no permanent injuries. Not so for Kate. Her face broke the windshield, and she landed on the pavement ten yards away. She was left with a crushed pelvis, internal injuries, and a jagged scar across her right cheek. The news came soon afterward that because of the damage to her pelvic area, she would never be able to have children. She was still in the hospital when Kurt visited her one afternoon and poured out his feelings. I don't know how to say this. He looked at his hands. Kate noticed a thin layer of perspiration on his upper lip. Kate winced against the pain in her midsection and sat up straighter. Her heartbeat felt strangely irregular as she studied Kurt's face. What is it? A long sigh came from Kurt's lips. I'm having a... His eyes lifted and met hers. I'm having second thoughts about getting married. For several seconds, Kate stared at him with her mouth open. Then the room began to tilt, and she closed her eyes to keep from feeling dizzy. Nothing had changed between them. Why now, three weeks after the accident, would Kurt be having doubts? When she opened her eyes, she saw something in his eyes that hadn't been there before. A strange coolness and an unyielding certainty. She massaged her throat and struggled to find her voice. Are you? Are you confused? I mean, everything's crazy right now. But we'll get through it, won't we? There was panic in her voice, a panic she hated. Or maybe it was something, I did, something we can talk about. A dozen possibilities crossed her mind in that very moment. But not for a minute did Kate expect what came out of Kurt's mouth next. I want children, Kate. Anguish filled his voice. It's the reason I want to get married, so that I can have a family. His words hit her like so many flaming arrows. I see. 
Her words were barely whis- a whisper, her heart breaking in half. I can't have kids, so you don't want to marry me, is that it? Kurt took her hand. His palms were sweaty. I'm sorry, I know it sounds terrible, but I can't change the way I feel. He crossed his arms and took a step back from Kate's hospital bed. Everything's different now. He apologized again and told her goodbye. It was the last time Kate ever saw him. The fallout was devastating. Kate couldn't decide which Kurt had run away from. The fact that she couldn't have children or that her face was disfigured. She spent two months in the hospital and then went home to complete her rehabilitation. Every day she fell deeper and deeper into depression that knew no bounds. Her parents were furious with Kurt, willing to do anything to help Kate rebound. But the news was too devastating. In a period of eight weeks, she had lost everything that mattered to her. Her fiancé, her good looks, and her ability to have children. Even her faith. God allowed this, she would tell her mother. No one will ever want me now. Kurt was wrong in what he did, her mother would insist. God will have someone else for you one day, you'll see. But Kate's depression grew worse, until she had no interest in getting out of bed, even after her injuries were healed. The questions assaulted her constantly. How could Kurt have left her? Was it really that easy to walk away from someone you planned to marry? And what would her life be like now, her face scarred, her body forever barren? Alone in the darkness each night, Kate had no answers for herself. Finally, her parents insisted on counseling. The sessions ran three times a week, and over the course of the year, Kate felt herself changing. What had been a deep and desperate Sorrow became a steely determination. She wouldn't roll over and die because a drunk driver had ruined her life. Kurt was gone, and he wasn't coming back. She wouldn't lie in bed dreading the past. Not any longer. The next year, Kate finished college and earned her emergency medical technician certificate at the same time. Gradually, her faith returned, and she found great peace in her relationship with God. No matter if Kurt had left, no matter how many people stared at her face with pity in their eyes, God would be there for her. He hadn't allowed the car accident. Drunk drivers were part of a fallen world. And she couldn't navigate a fallen world without God. At the end of the year, Kate was sure about what she wanted to do with her life, and she sought after it with a passion. If a car accident could change someone's life the way this one had changed hers, then she would become a paramedic. The job turned out to be everything Kate hoped it would be. The combination of prayer and all she learned through training gave her the chance to administer not only emergency assistance, but hope and peace to the victims that she came across. Only one area of struggle remained in Kate's life. She still had trouble connecting with men. Occasionally, she would stay after work talking with other paramedics or one of the firefighters who worked the same areas as she did but always she felt them looking at her and not into her. They don't see who I am on the inside, Kate told her mother. They see someone with a scar across her face. Kate could only imagine what they would think if they knew the rest of the story, that she couldn't have children, and so she kept walls up all around her heart, never allowing herself more than that a brief, shallow conversation with the men in her life. All the while, two desires buried in her heart, and over time they became prayers, prayers for not one, but two miracles. Please, God, she would pray when she was alone at night, please help me learn to love. 
bring someone into my life who will accept me the way I am. And please let me care for a child one day. Months became years, and still Kate struggled to let down the walls around her heart. Her lonely place in life was at least in part her own fault. But she felt helpless to move beyond her fears, to let down her guard, and risk having what happened with Kurt happen again. Finally, on the morning of Kate's 27th birthday, she uttered a desperate prayer. God, I give you my whole life. If you don't want me to find love, if children aren't in my future, so be it. I'll keep working at a par- as a paramedic, helping people the best I know how. I'll give it all over to you. That day, Kate felt more free than she'd felt in many years. Instead of feeling sorry for herself, desperate for a miraculous change, she embraced the reality of her life. One of her co-workers, a single paramedic named Tom, commented on the difference. You're glowing today, Kate. He patted her back. The two of them had known each other for over three years. But Kate had never allowed anything close to a deep conversation with him. Now he smiled at her, his eyes meeting hers. Let's take you out for a coffee after work. It's your birthday after all. Kate fought the instinct to shut out the offer to assume he was feeling sorry for her instead of she smiled and she agreed. Coffee with this man would be enjoyable. God would take care of her insecurities. But before the shift ended it, an emergency call came in. There had been a fatal traffic accident on the freeway, not two miles from the station. Kate and Tom were two of the first emergency personnel on the scene. What they saw was heartbreaking. The victim's car had gone off the freeway and rolled into a ravine. No other cars were involved, so police assumed immediately that the driver was under the influence of either drugs or alcohol, or he'd fallen asleep at the wheel. By the looks of it, two people were trapped inside the car. A man and a woman both appeared to be dead. Special machinery was needed to get to the bodies inside the car, and only halfway through the procedure did they hear the small, stilted cries of a child coming from the back seat. There's someone alive inside. Kate had been standing nearby, waiting to give emergency care to the victims, if either of them could be helped. Now that they were certain there was at least one living victim, Kate and Tom made their way past the workers to what remained of the mangled vehicle. Strapped in the back seat were not one but two children, an infant in a car seat, eyes wide open and alert, and a boy maybe two or three years old in an upright car seat. He was crying, his head was bleeding, his eyes filled with terror, In 15 minutes, working alongside the emergency crews, Kate and Tom were able to get the children out of the vehicle. As they worked, they were both aware of a heavy smell of alcohol. Once the children were out, Kate stayed with them, taking their vital signs, making sure that they had no serious injuries. The boy had huge brown eyes and olive-colored skin. He held tight to Kate's hand, looking at her every few seconds. Mommy, it's okay, honey. Kate tried to smile, her voice shaking. What's your name? The boy didn't answer the question. Instead, he reached out, took hold of his little sister's hand, and cuddled her close to Kate. Occasionally, he would raise one hand, his palm turned upward. Mummy, bye-bye? 
By the time Tom had helped to remove the bodies of the two adults, Kate felt a bond with the little boy and his infant sister that were beyond explanation. Tom motioned for her to follow him a few feet away. Kate left another paramedic in charge of the children. Police have details. Tom's face was grim. The children's mother is in jail. She signed her rights to her only living relative, her sister. The deceased couple is a sister and her husband. Apparently, the male victim has a history of drunk driving arrest. If the crash had killed them, alcohol poisoning might have. The reek of alcohol still. Kate looked back at the children. Who care for the kids now? Social services, Tom bit his lip. They'll take the kids to that hospital to be checked over. By tonight, they'll be part of the system. Two more kids waiting for a home. A lump formed in Kate's throat. The boy is, he's very special. Her voice was soft and strained. We'll be talking. Something gentle flashed on Tom's eyes. I was watching. Looks like you made yourself a little friend. The boy's name was Peter, and his sister's name was Cassie. Tom was right about how things played out over the next two days. The children were checked at the hospital and found to have only surface scratches and bruises. Then they were placed with social services and put in a temporary foster home. Kate couldn't get the little boy out of her head. The feel of his little hand in hers was something that stayed with her no matter how many hours and days passed. A week after the accident, Kate had a dream. In it, she saw herself with little Peter and Casey, caring for them and parenting them. The next morning, she went to work and talked to Tom. I'm thinking of taking them in, seeing if I could get an emergency approval to foster them, maybe even adopt them one day. Tom's eyes sparkled, the corners of his lips lifting in approval. Let me know if it works out. I'll do whatever I can to help. Kate made the calls, and things came together faster than she could have imagined. Because of her job working with the county, many of the checks on her background had already been done. Four weeks after the accident, Peter and Cassie were placed in her home as long-term foster kids. When she was at work, Kate's mother and father watched the children, and from the beginning, Kate knew they were an answer to her prayer in her life. The miracle I'd been waiting for, she told her parents. Tom made it good on his word. He came around several times a week when he and Kate were off work. Sometimes he'd stay and talk to Kate, opening up to her about his past and his own accomplishments, dreams and losses. Other times he would sit on the floor and play with Peter a rock Cassie when she was tired and couldn't be comforted. What started as a friendship of common likes and experiences soon became more. Tom told Kate he was falling in love with her, and Kate fought her desire to shut him out, to refuse his affection on grounds that he would certainly walk out of her life one day as Kurt did. Meanwhile, the children were very healthy despite their rocky beginning. Neither of them had obvious physical or emotional handicaps, and they took to Kate as if she'd been their mother forever. I can feel God working in my life, she told Tom one night after the kids were asleep. Just when I've given up hope, he's bringing about a miracle right before my eyes. The next step took place six months later when Kate got approval to officially adopt the children. That night, Tom came to celebrate with her. When the children were asleep, he pulled out a ring and asked her the question she never expected to hear again. Will you marry me, Kate? Let me be a father to Peter and Cassie. Let me love you in all the days of my life. Questions rose in Kate's heart. 
What about her face? What about the children? She couldn't have. But she and Tom had t- talked about those issues, and he didn't care. In what felt like a second miracle, Tom truly loved her f- for who she was, regardless of everything. Tears filled her eyes as Kay took the ring and kissed Tom and told him yes. They were married on her 28th birthday, and Kate marveled at the turns her life had taken. One car accident had shut the door on her future, ending her chances at love with Kurt and at being a mother to her own biological children. But the other had brought about not one, but two miracles. Two months after their wedding, Kate and Tom stood hand in hand, overcome with emotion as the judge finalized the adoption of Peter and Cassie. This time, when Peter looked up at her and said, Mommy, Kate smiled back and took his hand. I'm here, honey, and I'll always be here. What a beautiful story. My, I can really relate to all that poor girl went through. God bless her and that beautiful family. The next story is about friendship miracles, and it's titled, In Need of a Friend. Bonner Davis knew the end was near, but he could do nothing to change his situation. He had advancing throat cancer, mounting medical bills, and no way to pay for the experimental treatment that could save his life. A retired forest ranger, Bonner and his wife, Angela, lived in North Carolina where they existed on his meager pension in a faith bigger than the Smoky Mountains. Once in a while, Bonner would share his fears with Angela. She was his best friend, and though he looked forward to heaven, he didn't want to leave her. Angela's answer was always the same. God knows what we need, Bonner. I'm praying for a miracle, and somehow, somehow, I believe he's going to give us one. In nearby Spartanburg, a millionaire, Olson Matthews, was celebrating his 60th birthday, single and without any close friends. Olson chose to spend his day in the air. He was a novice pilot who always felt more complete when he was alone in his small Cessna plane. Sunshine reigned that afternoon, and Olson savored the familiar rush as he took into the air. He'd been in the air 20 minutes when the rush faded to a sort of soul-searching, which when often happened when Olson flew. What was life about, anyway? He had more money than he knew what to do with, but not a single person he could call a friend. Sure, Olson had advisors and peers he did business with, but he had no family, no friend who cared about him. This time, he flew, gazing down at the rolling hills and the valleys. Another thought filled Olson's heart. What about God? All his life, he denied the idea of both creation and creator But now, with his life waning toward the sunset years, he sometimes wondered, what if God was real? What if he had a few things to do before he died in order to be right with that God? The possibility set his nerves on edge and made him wish once more for a friend, someone he could share his thoughts with, perhaps even someone who knew something about God and why so many people believed in him. Olson was about to turn his plane around and soar back over the mountains when he heard a sharp harp. At that same instant, the engine cut out. Olson felt a wave of adrenaline rush through his veins, but he stayed calm. He never lost an engine before, but there were ways to handle the situation. He flipped a series of switches designed to restart the motor, but none of them worked. 
Okay, he told himself. Time for plan B. If the engine wouldn't re-engage, Olsen only hope was to glide the plane in lazy circles toward the ground and make an emergency landing. But using the wing flaps and other instruments, he could slow the speed of the aircraft and still walk away. At the same time, the plane could catch a raw current and plummet to the ground. Oh, God, he called the name out loud, and he heard the fear in his voice. If you are real, help me. I'm not ready to go. Two minutes passed in textbook fashion, but then, as Olsen had feared, a strong current dropped the right wing of the plane, and the craft began to tumble. Olsen had another thousand feet to go before hitting land. But as the plane fell, he spotted a lake. Water, he thought. That's my only hope. Landing in the trees or on the hilly ground would cause the Cessna to disintegrate on impact. Water God, if you're listening, lead me to the water. The ground was rushing up to meet him. Suddenly his plane fell to the left, and Olsen could see he was going to hit the small lake. The last thing he remembered was the sound of water breaking over his plane and the rush of ice-cold wetness filling the cabin. Suddenly the craft jolted to a stop, and Olsen smacked his head on the doorframe. After that, there was only darkness. Bonner was pouring himself a glass of iced tea when he saw a small plane tumble into a view and free-for-all into the lake at the edge of his property. Angela, quick, call 911. A plane just crashed into the lake. After years of outdoor training and living, Bonner had always been in good shape. But the cancer medication had taken its toll, and as if he ran toward the lake, he could barely catch his breath. Fifty yards, a hundred, two hundred, and finally he reached the shore. The situation was more grim than he thought. The wing of the plane jetted out of the water, but it was the otherwise buried into the section of the lake some ten feet deep and seventy-five yards offshore. No one else must have seen the crash because he was the only one standing at the water's edge looking for signs of life. His heart raced within him, and he still hadn't caught his breath, but he had no choice. Whoever was in that plane was drowning even at that very moment. Before he jumped in, he uttered a silent prayer, God, if I don't make it, if I don't make it back to shore, let Angela know how much I love her. Then he dove in and headed as hard as fast as he could toward the plane. Because of his weakened condition, the swim took Bonner twice as long as it normally would have. After five minutes, he reached the wing, and though his lungs were already burning from the effort, he sucked in as much air as he could, and down down he dove, his heart pounding, filling his sense with an urgency that drove him deeper, deeper, deeper into the fuselage door. He tried twice to open it, and finally, on the third try, the door swung free. Bono was out of air. He swam to the surface, nauseated from the effort, grabbed another breath, and went back down. This time, he found the pilot in seconds, and he felt around until he was sure the person was alone, feeling as though he could die at any moment. Bonner dragged the unconscious man to the surface. They weren't out of danger yet, and that terrified Bonner because, simply, he was out of energy. Help me, God, help me. Bonner left the words play in his mind again and again as he kept himself and the man afloat. It took no time to realize that the pilot wasn't breathing. Swimming with strength that wasn't his own, Bonner dragged the pilot back to shore. On the beach, despite his exhaustion, he managed to administer CPR. He was three minutes into the 
process when the emergency crew arrived and took over. He barely made it to the edge of the grove of the trees before he dropped to the ground, unable to go on. At almost the same time, Angela came running toward him. Bonner! She waved down one of the paramedics. Bonner heard her explain about his cancer. Help him, please. The emergency worker moved quickly and hooked Bonner up to intravenous fluids. They took him into the local hospital, and the four hours later, he was ready to go home. Before he left, he heard the news about the pilot. The CPR had saved his life. Bonner figured that might be the end of the situation, but the next day he received a visit from the pilot. My name is Olson Matthews. You saved my life. The man shook Bonner's hand. The paramedic said that you were praying out loud, thank God, at the same t- at the scene. Yes, Bonner stared at the man. You look wonderful, considering he should have died in the plane crash. My wife and I were both praying. The man's eyes grew watery. Thank you for that. He motioned toward Bonner's house. Could I come in? The two talked for almost an hour. Olsen explained that he'd held and he heard from his doctors about Bonner's cancer. I have a check for you, something to help with your medical costs. The man shrugged and gave Bonner a slight smile. Maybe it'll help you get the care you need. Then Olson asked Bonner about God, and with Antler at his side, Bonner told him about their faith and about living a life right before God. At the end of the conversation, Olson and Bonner prayed. Could you be my friend, Bonner? Someone I could visit now and then? Someone to talk to about God? A smile lifted the corners of Bonner's mouth. He squeezed Angela's hand. Definitely. Good. Olson stood to leave. I was asking God about a friend when I crashed, and now he's working everything out. Olson walked to the door, looked over his shoulder, and grinned. I think he's going to work everything out for you too, Bonner. When the man was gone, Bonner turned to Angela, and he remembered the check. He gave me something, a thank you, a thank you gift. Well, open it, Angela. Stood beside him, peering at the folded check. Bonner did, and both he and Angela fell silent, and they were shocked. The check was for $1 million. In the note section, it read only, Use this to get better. Bonner did just that. In the months that followed, he tried the costly experiment treatment. Three years later, in one of their many times together, Bonner and Olson agreed that God had done more than take part in the miracle of Olson's rescue and Bonner's healing. He also gave them the miracle of a new friendship. Oh my goodness, how beautiful. The final story I'd like to share with you today is uh, Miracles of Women, and it's called Letting Go. Carrie Clausen was a woman who clung to the people she loved. Growing up, she and her sister were inseparable, maintaining a bond that was even stronger as they became adults. It was the same way with her husband, close friends, and her aging parents. And it was especially so when it came to her children. Carrie was overprotective and fearful every day for their safety. It was something she despised about herself, but it remained all the same. There was no added peace from her faith in God or the uh, fact that Cole, had, who was five and Anna, three, had never suffered more than a skin knee. Help me have a looser hold on them, God, she would pray. But inevitably, she took to worrying every day. There were nights that summer when she couldn't sleep because of fears that one of or both the children would get hurt, or worse. 
And so, when tragedy did come, Carrie was expecting it. But nothing in her wildest imagination could have prepared her for the, that June morning when everything about her life changed in a single instant. That morning, Carrie and her husband, Mel, were packing their belongings for a move from West Hills, California, to nearby Thousand Oaks. For days, Cole and Anna had passed the time in the afternoon by playing outside with their while their parents filled the cardboard boxes and loaded them onto their trailer. By afternoon, they were nearly done, and Mel was in the back in the back bedroom with a friend who was helping them pack. Mommy, can you tie my shoes? Cole ran down the hallway, holding a pair of sneakers. Me and Anna were going to play outside back, okay? Carrie swept Cole into her arms, held him in her lap, and tied the child's shoes. You bet, she said, tossing Cole's straight brown hair. Just be careful and make sure you stay in the yard. Cole grinned, his eyes just twinkling. Then he disappeared out the back door with Anna close behind. Carrie picked up a handful of mail on the kitchen counter and found a magazine she'd been waiting for. Perfect, she thought. I'll go outside and read it. That way I can keep a better eye on the kids. But at that instant, a loud crash rang, sickening through the house, vibrating the floor beneath Carrie's feet. Cole! Anna! Carrie screamed as she ran out the back door. What she saw made her heart stand still. The 300-pound steel ramp at the back of the trailer had come down onto the ground. Little Anna stood nearby, frozen in place, her eyes with wide shock. There was no sign of Cole. Where's Cole? Carrie shouted at Anna. But the child remained motionless. Carrie ran toward the ramp, and there underneath was Cole's limp body. Blood was oozing from his nose, mouth, and his ears, and the heavy ramp was resting on his head. He showed no sign of life. Mel, Carrie screamed, help! Her husband had heard the crash and was at her side almost immediately, summoning a strength that was beyond their own. They lifted the ramp off Cole's head. Blood began pouring from his sunken skull, and Carrie swept him into her arms. My God, he's dead. Carrie was hysterical, her voice a shrill scream. She felt faint, and she passed Cole to Mel. Help him, help him, Mel. What do we do? Only Cole's tennis shoes weren't covered with blood, and Carrie had a sudden certain feeling that her child was no longer breathing. Get the car keys. We've got to get him to the hospital, Mel said, as he ran with Cole toward the family car. Carrie forced herself to respond. She grabbed the car keys from a kitchen counter and let Anna with her husband's friend. Then she sprinted towards the car, jumping into the driver's seat in seconds. They were in the nearest highway, racing towards Union Memorial Hospital. He's going to die, Mel. I can't drive fast enough. Carrie's hands shook and her heart raced within her. He's still breathing. Mel's voice was loud and insistent. He's not going to die. You need to pray, Carrie. You need to pray. Focus on driving and pray. Carrie prayed for several minutes, begging God to spare Cole's life. Then she remembered her favorite hymn, the one she sang whenever she needed to feel God's presence and peace. Quietly with tears, her voice, she began to sing the hymn that had been her favorite since she was a little girl. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. The quiet song brought a calm over Carrie's heart and allowed her to breathe more easily. She paused and glanced at her son, motionless in Mel's arms. How is he? Still breathing. Cole had still not moved, and Carrie thought for sure he would be dead by now. But if he was still breathing, then there was hope. There had to be. She continued to drive as a realization hit her. 
There was not a thing she could do to help. Nothing she could do to help Cole now. He was completely in God's hands, the same way both her children always had been, even when she'd been consumed by worry. In fact, worrying about them had done not, not any good at all. For some reason, the truth of that calm carry even further than she had been before. Through tears streamed down her face, she drove as fast as she safely could, praying constantly for God's intervention and believing with all her heart that he was working in Cole's life even at that very instant. Pray for a miracle, Carrie, Mel said quietly. He's breathing slower. I am, Carrie, said as she swallowed back a torrent of sobs. God's in control. Suddenly, a few blocks from the hospital, Cole coughed and began making gurgling sounds. Blood spewed from his mouth as he struggled to breathe. Mel spoke smoothingly to him, and the boy opened his eyes. Daddy, help me. The boy's words were slurred, and his eyes rolled back in his head. I want no sleep. I want to sleep. No, don't sleep, Cole. You might never wake up, Carrie thought. Cole moved restlessly in his father's arms, blood still gurgling within his throat. Cole, Carrie said as she kept her eyes on the road. Do you know that Mommy and Daddy love you so much, son? Cole made no response. We love you, Cole, Mel added, and God loves you, too. He will always take care of you. The child's eyes closed once more, and both Carrie and Mel privately sensed they were losing him. Carrie thought about the time just a few months earlier when she and Mel were tucking the children in at night. They had just finished saying their prayers. Mel explained to the children that it was Good Friday, the day when Jesus died many years earlier. I already know about that, Cole piped up. Our teacher at school told us Jesus died on the cross for us, and we can just ask him to live in our hearts. Carrie and Mel had smiled at their son, nodding in unison. That's right, Cole. The boy grinned. So I did it. You did? Carrie asked curiously. Cole nodded enthusiastically. Yes, I said a prayer, and I asked Jesus to live in my heart. Now as they rounded the corner and turned into the hospital's emergency room parking lot, Carrie felt strangely comforted by the scene, almost as if God wanted her to feel peace in the knowledge that Cole's place in heaven was secure. As Carrie pulled up near the entrance, she glanced at her husband. There were tears in her eyes and a deep sense of serenity. All her life she had worried while Mel had been strong and conf- confident. Now there was fear in Mel's eyes, and as they rushed him from the car, Carrie gripped his elbow. Mel, he's in the Lord's hands. Mel nodded, blinking back his own tears. I know. All we can do is trust him. Others in the emergency room stared in horror at the blood-covered child and his frantic parents as they were ushered into the examination room. As they laid him on a table, Cole began to cough and cry. I'm choking. Carrie felt sick as she realized it was true. He was choking on his own blood. She and Mel leaned over their son. It's okay, baby. Mommy and Daddy are here. You're going to be okay. Carrie took hold of Cole's small hand as once more his body went limp and his eyes closed. Around the room, a handful of nurses and doctors rushed to get the boy's vital signs and insert an IV into his arm. What happened? A doctor asked as he stood over Cole and felt for his pulse. Mel explained the situation, and as he did, Carrie sobbed quietly. She was no longer panicked, just deeply sad at what seemed like the certain loss of their son. There was no way he could survive being hit on the head by that heavy ramp. She forced the negative thoughts from her mind 
and prayed silently for the only way out of this disaster. She prayed for a miracle. When Mel finished the story, the doctor explained that Cole would need to be transferred to a nearby hospital across town where they had more sophisticated equipment for severe head injuries. We'll transport him in five minutes. Carrie quickly called her parents and asked them to come. And please pray, Mom, Carrie cried. Ask everyone to pray. Later, she would learn that before dark that evening, hundreds of people at churches in three states were praying for her son. Carrie, Mel, and two nurses stood in the room with Cole as they waited for the ambulance. The boy's skin color had grown frightfully pale, and both nurses were struggling to like, locate his pulse. We're losing him, one of the nurses shouted. Get the doctor in here. Carrie was still holding Cole's hand as she squeezed it tightly. Cole, honey, she said through her tears. No matter what happens, your daddy and I love you very much, and we're praying for you. She let go of the child's hand and stepped back to make room for the nurses. At that instant, Cole moved. Carrie narrowed her eyes, and Mel took a step closer to him. Then suddenly, in a surreal manner, Cole's small shoulders rose that he was nearly sitting up straight up. His eyes were still closed, and it seemed as if someone were supporting him with invisible hands behind his back. His long black eyelashes fluttered, and his eyes opened, staring blankly. In a weak but clear voice, he said, Jesus, please take care of me. Then he closed his eyes and sank back onto the hospital bed still once again. The nurses looked at each other and then at the Clausens in disbelief. Carrie and Mel stared at their son, stunned by what they had just seen and what had happened. Before anyone in the room could discuss Cole's movements or his simple words, an ambulance attendant rushed in and whisked the boy away. The rest of the evening passed in a blur. Friends and family gathered in the hospital waiting room while doctors performed a CAT scan on Cole's brain. Early tests showed that he had suffered extensive damage. We'll let you know more information as soon as we have it, one doctor told them. But I have to be realistic with you. His chances don't look good. Don't look very good at all. Two hours later, a neurosurgeon found Carrie and Mel in the waiting room and gently explained the x-rays of Cole's head. The trailer ramp had shattered his skull, sending bone fragments into the area of the brain that controls speech and hearing and memory. We'll need to operate right away, he explained. There's no telling the extent of his brain damage until we get in and see for ourselves. He warned them that even if Cole survived, he would not be the same boy he had been before. That ramp weighed 300 pounds, and the impact is going to leave permanent brain damage. You need to know how serious this is. Carrie collapsed in Mel's arms and sobbed. She pictured Cole grinning from his bed that night, last spring, talking about how he had prayed and asked Jesus to live in his heart. He was a bright, intelligent child who loved to make people laugh. Now she wondered if he would survive the night, and if he did, whether the part of him she knew and loved might be gone forever. As Carrie and Mel grieved for Cole, their friends and family clasped hands and formed a chain of prayer around them. The prayers continued for the next six hours while surgeons worked in the delicate damaged portion of Cole's brain. Again, Carrie felt an overwhelming sense of peace and acceptance. Not only was God in control of what happened to Cole, but for, for the first time since Carrie had become a mother, God was in control of her fear as well. 
Finally, hours after the surgery began, the doctor appeared and lowered his surgical mask. He motioned for Carrie and Mel to follow him, and then he opened a door. Come say hello to Cole, he said, his eyes twinkling. Carrie gasped softly and put her hand on her mouth. He's, he's, the doctor smiled. Come see for yourself. Carrie slipped her hand into Mel's, and together they followed the doctor to Cole's bedside. The child's skin looked like parchment, and his head was surrounded in bandages. Carrie reached her fingers toward him, and as she did, a tiny burp escaped from the boy's mouth. Excuse me, he whispered. Carrie felt a surge of elation. Cole could speak. and More than that, he still had his manners. They had not lost Cole after all. She gripped Mel's hands in her own, happy tears clouding her vision. Hours later, Cole was taken to the neurointensive care unit, where he improved with each passing minute. Could I have my toothbrush, please, he asked a nurse. She stared at Cole, then at his chart, and finally at Mel and and Carrie, seated nearby. The doctors don't know what to think about this boy, she said. Despite obvious signs of success, doctors continued to warn the Clausens that Cole could take a turn for the worse at any moment. Bleeding blood clots, seizures our and distant possibility because of the severity of his head injury. Worst of all, Cole carried a significant risk of developing a brain infection. He would have to undergo a series of painful intravenous antibiotics with treatments to counteract the risk of what could be a fatal complication. The medicine will be very powerful and will be administered directly into Cole's bloodstream, the doctor warned Carrie and Mel that night. The sessions will take 30 minutes and will be very painful for Cole. If there was any other way, we'd take it, but there isn't. Mel and Carrie stayed by Cole's side through the night, holding his hand and praying constantly. He looked so lost among the bandages and tubing that they began to wonder whether he would really survive. As Monty drew near, Cole moaned from nausea, and suddenly the room was filled with nurses. Carrie's tightened her grip on Cole's hand. Mommy, pray with me, he said in his voice weak. In that instant, Carrie felt her heart soar. If Cole could see clearly enough that the solution was prayer, then she had no doubts he would survive. She took Cole's hand in hers and prayed as she never had prayed before. She prayed with confidence that through the next three days, whenever Cole was awake, he asked just one thing of which ever parent was with him. Pray for me, Mommy, he'd say. Oh, please, Daddy, come pray with me. The next day, Cole was moved from the intensive care unit to the pediatric wing, and Carrie was approached by a therapist who had never met Cole. Uh, Mrs. Clausen, she said, we need to make plans for your son's treatment. I've studied his chart, and, well, it's a miracle he's alive, but now we have a lot of work to do. Carrie looked confused. I don't understand. The therapist checked her chart once more. Isn't your son Cole Clausen the one with the depressed skull fracture? Yes, but he just got up and walked to the bathroom by himself. He's been talking nonstop all day, and he's building a house of uh, Legos on his hospital tray. The therapist was silent for a moment. That's impossible. Carrie smiled, her heart filled with joy. No, ma'am. With a faith like my little boy has, nothing is impossible. Later that day, the technician who had done Cole's initial CAT scan stopped in to see him. 
Cole was just adding more blocks to his Lego house, laughing at Mel's jokes. The woman looked astonished, and Carrie grinned. I felt so sorry for you that night, she told Carrie, her voice so soft Cole couldn't hear her. I never in a million years thought he'd live. And if he did, her voice cracked. I didn't think he'd ever be like this again, especially not so soon. I've never seen anything like it. By the fifth day after Cole's accident, the only reason he was still in the hospital was to receive his intravenous antibiotics and the treatments. The doctor had been right about them. They were harrowing, and the Claussens had to endure Cole's pain along with him twice each day. The strong medication burned through Cole's body for the entire 30-minute treatment. Typically, the nurse would come in with the medication, and Carrie would climb into bed beside her son, holding him close and, and steadying him as if he, so he couldn't jerk when the needle was put in his arm. Sometimes the boy would be sleeping when the treatment started, but the moment the medication entered his bloodstream, he would wake up his eyes with, wide with pain and fear. Then Cole would wail aloud, begging for Carrie to pray, and Carrie would pray as hard as she knew how. The sessions were so gut-wrenching, Mel could not stand being in the room and hearing Cole's screams. The ordeal was exhausting, and one night, as the treatment time drew near, Carrie felt physically unable to watch Cole suffer through another minute of that torturous procedure. Still, she knew that Cole was counting on her to pray for him. She stood up and walked close to Cole's bed. He was fast asleep, but she pictured him awake in just a few minutes, screaming in pain, Help us, God. She sighed aloud and slowly knelt beside her son's bed. Lord, she whispered, All I can do is trust you like Cole trusts you. You are more powerful than any bacteria, than any medicine, than any fear. A worry. Please protect Cole from the pain. As Carrie stood, the door opened behind her, and the nurse entered the room with the medication. Carrie climbed into the bed and lay beside the boy, her arms wrapped around him. The nurse shifted Cole's arm and slid the needle into his vein. He opened his eyes and started to move. But Carrie patted him softly. It's okay, she whispered. Mummy's here. Mummy's praying. The corners of Cole's mouth turned up, and then he closed his eyes again. Additional nurses had entered the room, ready to help hold Cole down once the burning and crying started. The room was quiet and dark and hushed as everyone waited. Drip by drip, the medication entered Cole's veins. Ten minutes passed, then twenty but Cole remained peacefully asleep. The nurses exchanged curious glances and waited. Finally, a full 30 minutes had gone by, and the treatment was over. Cole had not so much as stirred even once through the entire session. Thank you, God, Carrie whispered as the nurses filed out one at a time out of the room. Thank you for knowing that I couldn't take any more. It was the second time since Cole's injury that God had clearly proven he was in control. After 10 days in the hospital, Mel and Carrie were able to bring Cole home. There were no signs of infection, and he could complete his recovery in his own bedroom. Time passed, and Cole healed completely. A year later, there was only a soft area along his skull and some hearing loss in his right ear to remind the for a time Cole didn't remember anything about what happened to him that fateful afternoon then one day while he was playing he looked at Carrie mommy I pulled the pin out he said simply that's what made the trailer ramp fall on me Carrie stopped what she was doing and stared closely at her son it really hurt, Cole continued, but then Jesus came, 
Carrie felt her heart beat faster. What did Jesus look like, honey? Cole smiled. He was just... all white. Then you and Daddy came and lifted the ramp off my head. Carrie remembered lifting the 300-pound ramp off Tiny Cole, and she shuddered. Is that all you remember? Jesus came to me when we got to the hospital, too. Cole's face was serious, his eyes dim with the memory. He lifted me up, and I asked him to help me. Then he hugged me and said, Cole, you're going to be okay. Carrie's mind flew back to the moment in the treatment room of the first hospital when they were waiting for the ambulance. Cole had sat up in bed as if cradled from behind, then almost as if he were in a trance. He had asked Jesus to take care of him. Carrie remembered her son's faith in the days that followed, and suddenly tears filled her eyes. Oh, Cole, she knelt beside her son, taking him in her arms, as she did. She could sense another set of arms enfolding them both, arms that had been there to hold her little boy in his great hour of need, when there was nothing more she could do for him. Amen. Now that was a beautiful story. So you know there's always God is with us all. And thank you, Karen Kingsbury, for um, rewriting that story in your book of Treasury of Miracles. So thank you all for listening today to our Treasury of Miracles. Uh, I hope you enjoyed those. Before I close today, I'd like to uh, share something with you all, a thought for the month. From the book, uh, Don't Sweat the Small Stuff. It's all about small stuff. Written by the late author Richard Carlson, Ph.D., who passed away in 2006 from a pulmonary embolism while doing a flight from uh, San Francisco to New York. He was going to give a speech and talk. And he was only 45 years old. But, oh, my goodness, he had so much spirit and knowledge. So I thought you would enjoy this today, something to think about. And it's called, uh, what he he wrote, uh, was learn to live in the present moment. Sometimes it's hard to do that, but let's try it. Okay, let me read this to you all. To a large degree, the measure of our peace of mind is determined by how much we are able to live in the present moment. Irrespective of what happened yesterday or last year and what may or may not happen tomorrow, the present moment is where you are always. Without question, many of us have mastered the neurotic art of spending much of our lives worrying about a variety of uh, things all at once. We allow past problems and future concerns to dominate our present moments, so much so that we end up anxious, frustrated, and depressed, and hopeless. On the flip side, we also postpone our gratification, our stated priorities, and our happiness, often convincing ourselves that someday will be better than today. Unfortunately, The same mental dynamics that tell us to look forward to the future will only repeat themselves so that someday never actually arrives. John Lennon once said, Life is what's happening while you're busy making other plans. When we're busy making other plans, our children are busy growing up. The people we love are moving away and dying Our bodies are getting out of shape, and our dreams are slipping away. In the shot, we miss out on life. Many people live as if life were a dress rehearsal for some later date in the future. It is, in fact, 
No one has a guarantee that he or she will be here tomorrow. Now is the only time we have, and the only time that we have any control over. When our attention is in the present moment, we push fear from our minds. Fear is the concern over events that might happen in the future. We won't have enough money, our children will get into trouble, or we get old and die, or whatever. To combat fear, the best strategy is to learn to bring your attention back to the present. Mark Twain said, I have been through some terrible things in my life, some of which actually happened. I don't think I can say it any better. Practice keeping your attention on the here and now. Your efforts will pay great dividends. That was really good advice and something to think about. In fact, on that same uh, topic, I was talking to a friend the other day, and they had a friend that always was living in the future, thinking about, well, I'd love to go on that trip, but I've got to do this first. I want to take the kids fishing, but um, I've got to do this first. Or, well, maybe next year we can do that. Maybe someday we can do that. Well, someday never came because one day they got up and they had a heart attack and died. So they, the someday aisle out there for so many people. So folks, live each day like it's your last and make it the best that it can be. Love the people around you and be good to and kind to others and bring love to everyone you know and make it a more special world that way. Thank you for listening today. And I hope you'll have a wonderful week and a wonderful month. And until next time, take care and may God bless. This is Natalie Silva with Life Treasures and Golden Moments. Thank you.